and welcome to Health Watch. I'm your host, Carolyn Wilson from Ledgelight Health District. The goal of this program is to bring you information on a wide range of important and interesting health topics and to introduce you to the great people doing work across the community. Today, I'm joined by Daryl McGraw from Formally Inc. And we're gonna be talking about the intersection of public health and criminal justice. Daryl, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for having me. It's an awesome opportunity to be here. You know, I'm, I'm excited. Great. So, uh, Daryl, you and I uh, just met recently. Uh, I think we have a lot of colleagues in common, but I'd like to start things off today by getting to know you a little bit more. Uh, sure. Tell us about yourself. Oh, so yeah, my name is Daryl McGraw. I started an organization, like you said, called Formerly Inc. And Formerly Inc. is an organization we do technical assistance and mentoring. And basically what we want to do is the goal of Formerly Inc. is to build that bridge between the, the, correctional, the correctional system and the community. You know, for me, I spent 10 years of my life in and out of the correctional system or what I today call it an installment plan. And, you know, every time I, you know, found myself getting out of prison, there was really no services like you know there weren't any any services to help me like reunite or reacclimate re myself back into the community and you know so it was rough and just like for any person that's getting out of prison without those natural supports it's it was a struggle and um you know i like to always say that um in connecticut we do a really great job of locking people up but we don't do such a good job of returning them and getting them preparing them to come back home and, um, and one of the things that we know, 95% of the people that are incarcerated will be released at some point in time. So Connecticut has what we call, um, in prison, they have this, what we call a, um, AP room. And the AP room is the admitting and processing, right? So when you go in, they, you know, they take your, um, your clothes and your dignity, if you will, and they give you an ID and they give you all your clothes and everything back. I mean, they give you jail clothes and so on and so forth. And every jail that you go to, there's an AP room and this process happens. But when you get out of prison, there's no process to release you. You just get released. And there's no AP room in the community to give you your dignity back, dress you back up and, and prepare you for the community. So that's kind of the work that I do with uh, in, in collaborations with others around the state and with, within the New London County um, area as well. That's amazing. It sounds like you've really identified a, a gap in services. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where some of the best programs come from. Absolutely. Um, tell me a little bit, I know you have a, a deep background in human services. Tell me a little bit about your journey um, and how you, you came to start Formally Inc. Oh, wow. Carolyn, man, you, you asking some deep questions. You started out right now, hardball questions, right? <laughs> um, I appreciate the question. Um, so it was it was crazy. I spent 10 years of my life in and out of the um prison system. And you know, I have to like tell you this piece because this is a piece that for me, um, you know, when I was on when I was incarcerated, um, I was in Hartford Correctional, West Wing, 25 cell. And um, this guy came by my cell and he says, you know, I got this book I want you to read. And I was like, man, if I was reading books, I wouldn't be in trouble, right? So um, he was like, no, I really want you to read this book. And the book was A Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it was like this 40-day spiritual journey. And, um, you know, so what that meant is that you had to read the book in 40, each chapter in 40 days, right? Right. So it's 40 chapters, 40 days. On my court date was 41 days away. Long story short, I followed the instructions. I'm like thought it was like a message from God. So I'm like writing this, like every day, God, do you see me in this cell writing and so on and so forth. And um, needless to say, through that process, I found purpose within that cell. And that through that 40 day spiritual journey while incarcerated, I have found purpose. And my purpose was to use my story, my lived experience, as a tool to help others find recovery and find freedom, not only physical freedom, but mental freedom as well. So through that, you know, I was released June 10th, 2010, right? And um, I remember filling out, you know, getting out, I had 
what today I call, I had six notebooks and a GED. And I had what I call today, uh, um, those are my, the roadmap to reentry. And, you know, about a, maybe two days, three days out, I had my resume. And while I was in prison, I was working as a peer mentor. And um, so I was helping people inside. I was working with the addiction services. Like, you know, I was doing all this like really great work behind the walls. So when I got out on my resume, I wrote Department of Corrections Peer Mentor. And within like an hour of sending my resume out, I got a phone call and they were like, hey, can you come down? Can you? So sure, I went to this interview. I had my one shirt, my one tie and an old pair of shoes that I shined up with some Vaseline, right? That's a tip for you. That's a little Martha Stewart tip for you and your, and your, and your viewers, right? And I um, went to this interview and the lady was so excited. She was super excited that I, she was like, I, we never had anyone from the Department of Corrections ever come here and apply for a job. What was it like working with those prisoners? I was like, uh-oh, you know, I think she, she thought that I was, like at CO or something. So I explained to her that I was an inmate working in a peer role. And she was like, oh, and she closed the folder and she said, we'll be in touch. About four days later, she called me back and she says, you know, we have like counselors, you know, she had me come back and I went down there and she says, we have counselors, we have, um, that have bachelor's degrees, that have master's degrees, but they don't have what you have. And what many of us have is what we would, what we call lived experience. And they gave me a shot. And um, shout out to Sound Community Services in the New London area. I can't, you know, I got to shout them out because when I, they gave me my first shot and I became a recovery specialist. And um, I worked there as a recovery specialist for a while. And then I got promoted to work with um, the young adults, right? Not too long after Sandy Hook, we created the Access Center, which was for 18 to 25, troubled youth, emerging youth. Uh, we work with that population. And then, um, you know, I was going to a lot of conferences and speaking and so on and so forth. And next thing you know, that led to me working, um, getting an offer to work for, um, you know, someone called me and, um, and offered me a position with um, the Yale Department of Psychiatry. And I was like, yeah, right. I got a criminal record. There's no way you get. And sure enough, they um, I did some research and, and knew that I was a huge advocate in the criminal justice world, really making, you know, you know, really advocating for criminal justice reform before it was, if I could say sexy, like everyone's talking about it now, but you know, I've been doing this work for over 10 years. And, you know, um, and through that relationship and others, I ended up getting a job with Yale. And um, that job was actually contracted through the uh, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, where I became the associate director of the Office of Recovery Community Affairs. And not too long after that, my um, director had retired and I was um, promoted to director. So I was actually working for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. So, I mean, this journey has been amazing. If I could have wrote it myself, I could have never imagined the things I accomplished in a short amount of time. I literally went from being on a bunk in prison to being a director um, you know, and not with, without some bumps and bruises, but it really, I really got to see the um, behavioral health field from, from being a recovery specialist and actually providing direct services to be working in the access center as middle management and then actually going to Demis, which is like the helm, the mothership, right? And actually seeing how programs are funded and uh, put together and supported throughout the state. Sounds to me that's as comprehensive of an understanding as you can get. Yeah, um, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Formerly Inc. The, what a cool name for one thing because it does a couple of things there. What you touched on this briefly. What are some of the major services that you're providing right now to people? Oh, so I think the major. You know, it was interesting. Really wanted to just offer mentoring services and re, and connect people to support services in the community. But what we found more so is that we found the need for technical assistance for organizations, organizations that are working with justice involved individuals. You know, um, a lot, there's a lot of funding that's out there, but are the people getting, are, is the funding getting connected to the people that need the service the most? And what we see is a lot of times, even throughout the state and throughout the country, 
the people that are closest to the problem are um, usually impacted people like myself, but always furthest away from the resources. So what we, you know, me creating Formerly Inc. not only gave me, you know, I, when I worked for Demas in Yale, I was getting a seat at the table and, you know, sometimes there's this thing called tokenism, right? And so therefore I fit the bill. I was African-American, I was a black guy. I had the, you know, here I am at the table, but the decisions, I really wasn't part of the decision-making. And so I just decided to create my own table and start, you know, so now when I go to the table, I represent Formerly Inc. You know, I've partnered with other organizations. I actually have a great relationship. I, I do some part-time work at CCSU as, as a reentry a, a policy and reentry analyst. I, I have a great, you know, I just um, started a great relationship with um, C4 Innovations out of Massachusetts, where we're building this amazing criminal justice branch um, that we were looking forward to seeing. I'm, I'm excited to see where that goes and, and how that um, builds to fruition. So, you know, I've had an opportunity to work nationally, but also within our state. You know, we just passed the, um, the free phone bill, free phone calls in prison. And um, a lot of people are probably not excited about that, but the connection to community and family, you know, we need that. We want people, we're not responsible for how people go to prison but we really should be responsible for how they come home. And that just that phone call of being able to talk to a loved one can keep somebody sane and, 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 and on the right track and desire to do better when they get out. And I think that that's what, you know, we're, we're, we should be looking more at rehabilitation, more so than and what we've seen over the years and through the histories is that the criminal justice system in this country is now it's actually doing more damage to people than it is um, actually helping. Wow, that's uh, it's very important. It sounds to me like you're really <laughs> identifying gaps and resources and and really making a huge impact in the community. Yeah. Um, we have so much more to talk about, um, but right now we're going to take a quick break, sure. and we will be right back uh, with more Health Watch. The thing that drives me every day as a dad is him. His real name is Darion, and we call him uh, Day Day for short. Every day he's hungry for something, whether it's affection, attention, knowledge. And there's this huge responsibility in making sure that when he's no longer under my wing, that he's a good person. I think the advice I would give is you don't need to know all the answers. The craziest thing was believing that your dad knew everything. So as a dad, you felt like you had to know everything. You had to get everything right. It's okay to make mistakes. Just do it from the right place. As long as it's coming from love, then, you know, it kind of starts to work itself out. I want him to be able to sit back one day and go, we worked together, we did a good job. I'll say my kid's pretty dope. The family's visit to the forest inspired a beautiful question. Mother, mother, am I a tree? You tell me to stand tall. You tell me to stay rooted. I think I am a tree. My child, my child, of course you are. But what kind of tree will you be? The kind to hug or the kind to climb? Doesn't matter what you choose, so long as you choose to be a tree that's kind. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. Welcome back to Health Watch. I'm your host, Carolyn Wilson, and today I'm joined by Daryl McGraw. And before the break, we were talking a little bit about Daryl's journey to starting uh, his business uh, that serves people uh, in the community, sometimes facing reentry problems, but also providing all sorts of technical assistance as well to other organizations. So Daryl, I'd love to hear a little bit more about policy work. Right mm -hmm. before the break, you did mention um, one piece of legislation about phone calls. Mm -hmm. um, tell me some of the other 
policy issues that that you're interested in right now that are affecting people? Well, we just seen we're actually seeing. Uh, I believe the governor is going to sign off on clean slate if he hasn't already, and that's where individuals who have had um, criminal records, you know, seven, you know, um, the criminal record is is a huge barrier, right, uh, um, for individuals getting back on their feet, whether it be you know through housing, employment, and so on and so forth. So after seven years for certain offenses and ten years for others, some of them, <clears throat> excuse me, some of them felonies we're seeing that um those will be the um some for some and, and let's be clear not all charges i believe um offenses against children and sexual offenses and things like that will not be automatically erased but there are some charges that will and um you know which for many people will be a, a game changer and they'll allow them to get employment gainful employment where they'll actually be able to make a livable wage and um, as taxpayers and as people we should want to see that you know, I'd be remiss to talk about not to talk about if we're not talking about the way this criminal justice system as a whole was built through systemic racism and um, a lot of the um, systems that we see now that were built many, many years ago really affect gravely black and brown communities, right? So me being a survivor of mass incarceration, I'm also a survivor of trauma and PTSD and a person in long-term recovery, which means I haven't used the substance since May 7, 2007. So all of these factors come into play and then you add the criminal, then you add the criminal record to it. And it just creates more and more barriers, um, housing issues and so on and so forth. So I'm excited to see that our state is, is moving in that direction. Connecticut has always been looked at as a leader in criminal justice reform. We definitely have a long way to go to look more. I'm looking forward to working more prosecutors and even law enforcement and other individuals as we move forward within our state to make change with, um, you know, in our communities. Um, but right now, I'm happy with Clean Slate if it, if it goes through as, as planned. I'm also excited to see um, the phone calls because I know that will start and keeping families connected, fathers connected to their children and so on and so forth. So I'm excited to see those changes, but um, there are definitely some more um, like the employment barriers and so on and so forth. I like to see those lift as well as the housing barriers as well, because individuals who get out sometimes can't return back to government housing. And that's a huge separation amongst families, right? So if you were living in government subsidized housing and you, for whatever reason, got in trouble and got a felony conviction, you're no longer allowed to return there. And then, so that actually is breaking families instead of putting them back together. And I don't believe that that's something that we should be focusing on. I don't believe that's something that we should even be entertaining in our state of Connecticut. Um, and shout out to OIC, um, you know, OIC is my office is on 106 Truman Street at in the OIC building. And um, OIC has done amazing work. And, you know, if it wasn't for OIC, I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing because when I first, the first time I was released from prison, I went to OIC and I, and I found a job. Um, there was a guy, Rich Lamparelli, that got me a job. And when I went back there after, you know, when I got on this side of the track, um, Rick, Rich wasn't there anymore. And, and I went to Nikisha, the ED, and I said, I want to be the next Rich Lamparelli because he was so helpful and getting you to jobs and connecting you to services. And every city needs somebody to be able to connect people who are justice involved to services, whether it be employment, housing, whatever, we need to be, we need to be able to those people to do that. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up um, uh, the topic of systemic racism. Now we could probably do a whole show. We could do 10 shows um, yeah. talking All about day. that. All day, let's part two. <laughs> when, 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 when I'm coming back, when I'm coming back, you got me now. We'll put you on the list, Daryl. So, the concept of racism as a public health issue. Um, more and more public health is taking a look at things like the social determinants of health, which include things that we've just been talking about, like uh, poverty, education, transportation. Um, yeah. Tell me, in your journeys of working with people and you know life experience in general, but serving the community and helping people, how are you seeing these things play out in real life? Like, is this just a a model or how are you seeing this is no, we're seeing, the truth 
I mean, we're seeing this like, you know, all from if you look at the social determinants of health in every every in every aspect. And we'll just look at um release. Let's just look at reentry release, right? A lot of times individuals are being released from prison without IDs, right? And this is a sore spot. DOC is trying to do the best. So we're not here to knock any system. We're just trying to make systems better, right? So you get released from DOC with no ID. It would be very, you can't get a COVID shot. You can't get this. You can't, there's nothing that you can do without an ID. So there's all these different things. So there's one challenge. Day one, you're already faced with a barrier, right? With this criminal record. And, and then when we look at from a systemic racism piece, the national um, level of minorities is 64%. Right in the state of Connecticut, 64% minorities, and you know, the numbers vary depending on who's counting. We think that they're higher, but let's just for the sake of this conversation, 64% of minorities are inside of our Connecticut prison system. For we only make up 14% of the state's population, right? And, and that's the national those numbers are they mirror the national level, right? So here you see if 14% of the, we only make up 14% of the population, but yet we're 64% of the population inside. So what you're seeing is brothers, sisters, mothers, all these people missing from these minority communities, they're incarcerated, right? So it'll be difficult for, and then when they come out, they're faced with these challenges of whether it be health, education, low income, poverty, all these different things that are affected. And one of the number one things is, is mental health, right? We don't talk enough about mental health. And me being a trauma survivor, I didn't even know I was a trauma survivor. I do a talk on urban trauma. And um, we talk about urban trauma and witnessing violence and being perpetrators of violence in these poverty stricken areas. We don't talk enough about trauma. And then you think about it as a child, you're traumatized. Then you become a, an adult and you go into the prison system you're traumatized, and then you're released. At no point is this trauma being addressed. So I would love to see our school system starting to use the ACEs. I would love to see, I would love to see our um, prison systems using the ACEs system, but not just using it to identify trauma, but using it to identify trauma and starting to address the trauma issues. I think that, that at that point, we'll start to see a lot of those social determinants of health addressed because many of them are rooted in trauma. Absolutely. And certainly, you know, a little bit about me, um, you know, I work a lot in substance use prevention, focusing on youth. Right. And one of the things that we spend time talking about is resilience and, uh, you know, ACEs, uh, adverse childhood experiences. Right. And um, the more of those that you have, the more your risk for things like substance use disorders and, right. you know, making bad choices and, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, prevention, everything that you know about how people, the struggles that people have and the barriers that people face. Right. So talk I think to the that, pre, talk to the prevention community. What would you like us to know? What do we need to be uh, focusing yeah, on? Yeah, you know, I love prevention. I love prevention. I love prevention treatment, but recovery is my thing, right? Yeah. And recovery has always been, we, we always felt like we were the stepchild and we received the funding last or whatever falls off the table, the recovery community gets. But we all need to work together, prevention, treatment, and recovery, right? And I always say, if prevention doesn't have people in recovery at the table, then you're missing a step. If treatment doesn't have people with lived experience at the table, you're missing a step. Right, so I would say number one, we just talked about ACEs in, in 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 the treatment of trauma. That's I believe that's a real great place for us to start from a prevention message because you can identify children who are already like myself. I my you know my trauma was my dad leaving at six years old. If somebody had did an ACEs study with me when I was in school. I probably could have probably prevented me from going to prison, probably prevented me from using substances. We don't know, but I'm saying we could have started there because no one identified that that was an actual trauma in my life that affected my life all the way through adulthood. And many other people that I know who, saw, who, who struggle with substance use, when you start to peel the onion back, you start to, you start to see trauma. So I think that our, my, our friends of prevention need to be pushing, pushing, pushing for more trauma studies and trauma work in early, early, early detection, like we do in any other disease, right? 
We do early detection. This is preventable. Addiction is preventable. So we need to be addressing those issues from that perspective. I would love to work with anybody that's working with these populations to not only bring the lived experience perspective, but this is what you need. You know, I also do, we, we have formerly Inc. We train, we do a training called forensic peer support. And that is really key because what we're doing is training individuals like myself with lived experience to work with prevention agencies, to work with law enforcement, to work with other organizations, but bring their lived experience to those organizations and use it as a tool to help individuals um, get better. I love the question, Carolyn. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, uh, music to my ears, and we will definitely be talking more. Um, as, we, as we wind things down today, and we could go on forever, of course, um, tell me about, just because you're, you're somebody who works with people, mm -hmm. you, you have a very rich history and uh, inspiring journey for how you came to help people. Mm -hmm. Tell me some of the lessons learned that, that really speak to the human condition. Like, what are the, what do you want people to know? Like, what's your message of hope for people? Yeah. Oh man, you got another hour, right? So, um, I think the message, there's two things, two things that I think, well, three things, if you give it to me, right? Number one, I always believe in the way we solve our community problems is a three-legged stool. It's CSI. I know you're thinking, Carolyn, crime scene investigators, but it's really community systems and individuals. With the community, us being ready to prepare for individuals coming home and having services ready for them, that is the community's role. And in the system, preparing individuals and preparing organizations to receive these individuals, as well as the, the individual being prepared and having some skin in the game to receive treatment or whatever services they need. That's the three-legged stool. With any one of those components not working together, the stool topples over. So community systems and individuals have to work together in order for us to um, properly set people up for success on their journey. I also believe in um, pebbles and boulders, right? I always talk about pebbles and boulders. Pebbles, the boulders are the things that you can see, but the pebbles are the things that we forget about that we don't see or we don't think about. And those are the things that keep us slipping and falling. So it's the little things that we tend to overlook. The things that everybody takes for granted, like, you know, having food in the refrigerator or a parent at home or whatever, right? These things are factors that other people, the things that you like, other people want. So think about that. And um, I think that the biggest thing that I would like to say is probably, you know, learning more and more, especially from a racial equity lens, race is a social construct, right? Understanding that race, and this is probably a whole different conversation, but there's no biological differences between black and white people, right? So therefore, you know, like when you go to the hospital, they don't say, oh, I gotta go get this white heart or I gotta go get the black heart. They don't do that, right? So we need to really, you know, once we start having these conversations more and more and having more dialogue, we start to realize how much we're alike than different. And once we start to get those differences out the way, then we as a community can move forward. Daryl, I can't say thank you enough for joining us today. This has been an absolute pleasure, and and I can't wait to to talk to you more at another yeah. time. Of course, me too. Part two. I'm telling you, we just gave a little sampler. That's all. Right. So to our everybody watching today, I want to thank you for watching Health Watch. Join us right here next time on Health Watch. Cool.